Hello, everyone. All right. Thank you. Um, welcome back to the Docs Down Under Mini Conference. It's great to see all these beautiful faces. Um, we're going to kick off this session with uh, the incomparable Ricky. Um, she's going to be telling us all about Stephen King and his advice for technical writers. And in case you don't know, um, this year Ricky's basically LCA. I think she's doing four talks, um, which is <laughs> which is kind of incredible. Um, if you didn't catch her talk yesterday at WootComp, I strongly recommend uh, checking it out. Uh, hopefully it was recorded. I, I don't know. Give you a link because I also okay. wrote an article about it. It's on our website. Okay, but if you didn't check it out, it's great. It's about not being a rock star and a lot of Willie Nelson. So it was, it was awesome. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much all I have to say. Take it away. Thank you. Um, and thank you to, uh, uh, to you and Lana for inviting me to do this. Um, I should say, I have uh, the trick to getting four talks is to show up with talks ready, and then when people um, have to cancel or whatever, then you say, I've got one, I've got one. And so that's how it happened. It worked out very well for me. Um, and I'm happy to be here again this year. Last year was my first LCA, and I really loved it. And so um, this year, uh, I was excited to come back. And I haven't been to Hobart before, which is amazing. Um, I would like to live here forever. Uh, so. I have been working, I'm working on opensource.com right now, which is a, a site supported by Red Hat, but it's a community site. Um, it's, uh, we publish, um, our team publishes some of the content, and then um, more than 60% of the content is um, contributed by members of open source communities outside of Red Hat, which means not our team also. Uh, and so um, it's a great way to um, have a platform, um, you know, where you can actually publicize the project you're on or, um, share best practices or a script that you wrote um, and maybe you would you also have written this for your blog or you'd like to write it for your blog but people don't know about your blog um, we can kind of help you get um, more attention to your blog and so it's it's really a community site um, uh, it's not a, a regular subscription based publication or anything we don't have ads or whatever because Red Hat supports it so it's a little different publishing model my background um, actually next month will be 20 years since I've been in this field <laughs> And uh, I actually started uh, at a tech publishing company and worked in customer service fulfilling back issues for print magazines back um, in February of 97. And that was uh, Windows Developers Journal, CC++ Users Journal, and uh, SysAdmin Magazine, and a bunch of magazines like that. And then um, eventually I moved over to SysAdmin Magazine. Anyway, over the years I've worked in a lot of areas of tech publishing. I've done lots of different kinds of writing in my different roles. And, um, you know, I, I haven't done uh, project documentation, but I've done a lot of um, documentation, you know, and then I've edited lots of documentation that people have written for various publications I've worked on. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this project, but I'm always thinking in, in articles, and um, I ended up writing an article uh, ab about this talk. I had this in my head, and then um, I ended up writing the talk. So. I uh, don't feel like you have to take notes or whatever if something, if you're interested in the link or whatever, it's probably already in this article I wrote on the site and I'll just kind of be summarizing what was in that article. Um, so before you write anything, um, it, there will be a few questions uh, you have to ask yourself or you should be asking yourself. Like, what, Obviously you're going to want to know what you're writing about, um, what the scope of that topic is going to be. Um, what's the purpose for what you're writing about? What's your end goal? Um, is it just so you remember it, or is it so that you're reaching specific audiences or um, achieving some other kind of goal like that? Um, who is your reader? That's going to matter a lot in how you um, uh, deliver the content and um, what you're going to be explaining in the depth that you'll explain topics. And then um, how will you be reusing the content? If you think about that in advance, where this content could be repurposed, you can end up saving yourself and possibly your team and colleagues a lot of time um, because any research you're doing for your one topic, you could potentially be also collecting information that you would use if you repurposed it or wrote a different version of it for a different audience. Um, you'll, you'll be thinking about what kind of research you'll need and what these sources would be. Um, and then you'd want to create an outline before you ever start writing and then revise. And I'll go into a little bit more detail throughout this talk. So examples of um, why you might be um, writing a, a, about a topic and uh, what you would be t writing about is perhaps you want to let your community know about a bug fix to a project or a security update. Uh, maybe you need to um, provide a uh, project status update to a manager or a conference update and let them know that they, their money was well spent um, and uh, that you actually got something out of an event you went to. And also share with the team that wasn't able to go, you know, any takeaways that might be helpful. 
Um, maybe you need to tell developers about a new process in your project, and that's going to be a different um, audience, generally. And, um, or maybe you want to inform the press, uh, uh, the tech press, or even the broader press about a late, uh, the, the latest software release, or changes, or some innovative new technology you have in your project. Um, that managerial um, audience is going to have a much different um, uh, uh, background, perhaps, than some of these other audiences, you know, and so you'll be thinking about the level of explanation and what, they, what information they actually care about before you ever dive in. Um, so let's look at some of the uh, general audiences here. Three main categories is you're going to have a lay audience that may or may not know the technical depth um, of, of a topic. And um, then you'll have the managerial and you'll have the experts. Um, I have the link in the article online too. This was uh, for a college uh, site. There's many other sites you can find that will help explain general audiences, but I think this was pretty good, lay audience, managerial, and experts. Um, and uh, so the lay audience would have no uh, specific technical knowledge, perhaps. Uh, maybe they're just interested in the community or maybe they're just an end user of the project. Um, and so often they will need some background information and uh, they'll expect more definition. So um, think about your acronyms. Uh, a lot of acronyms, we use so many crazy acronyms. I often have to look them up, I can't remember. And um, so you, you will often need to de define the acronym the first time you, you say it in, in an article or a, a documentation. Um, and then the managerial audience um, may or may not have the technical knowledge and um, they will be needing information that will help me them make business decisions or um, project decisions and so that's going to be different content. Um, often they, they will need facts and statistics, you know, and maybe some research to back up whatever you're, you're writing about. Um, and the experts may be the most demanding um, and, uh, because they already know and so they're, they're looking for what you got wrong, <laughs> you know, or what's just your opinion and you're not actually citing sources. And so um, citing sources and reliable sources would be more important um, to back up any uh, uh, assertions you're making for an expert audience. Um, now, if you're writing a, a press release, whole different beast. And if you work with people who write press releases, um, as uh, a member of the press for a very long time, I can't recommend anything better than I, I recommend the care and feeding of the press. Um, Esther Schindler's a uh, longtime tech journalist, and she helped put this together with other members of the Internet Press Guild, um, which I was recommending to you yesterday, John. It's a really great group, and they put some great resources. Um, if you want to open the door to the tech press, um, uh, this is a great uh, thing to, to read because you'll find out right away that they're what annoys them. They cover that <laughs> very early on. Uh, don't call them ever. That they're very clear about that. They don't want a phone call. Um, so I won't go into details at all in this talk about how to write um, a press release because um, uh, I could not possibly do it better than this. And that's also linked in the article on our website. And then um, uh, I won't go into detail about writing manuals because that would be a whole conference. <laughs> they have whole conferences for that, right, the docs, and, um, <laughs> and many books. Um, but on our website, uh, Rich Bowen, one of my colleagues, he gives um, this talk at different events, um, uh, RDFM, uh, which I think you probably know what that acronym means, um, how to read the flippin' manual and how to write a manual worth reading. I asked, after I saw him give that talk at uh, ApacheCon two or three years ago, I, I was like, this is so awesome because he, um, it's an hour or less long talk, but um, the list of resources he gives is so excellent in that talk that um, I talked him into writing um, an article for us. And then I also um, used it to launch a whole series that we still run. It's a community contributed column on writing documentation. And so um, you could start there, though. He, he um, has excellent advice for writing documentation, so I won't deep dive into that either. All right, so now you think you're ready to write because you did all these other things. You defined your audience, um, but you're not ready to write yet. Um, so this is where the Stephen King uh, uh, comes into my talk. So I've been thinking about writing fiction a lot lately. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I grew up, and I wanted to write fiction. And here I am, about 20 years later, and I don't have a fiction bone in my body anymore because I've been writing you know, for tech publications for all these years. And so I started thinking about this a, a year or two ago, and um, I'm just really struggling with my imagination now. You know? And so I had heard that um, this book on writing, A Memoir of the Craft by Stephen King was really good. And I liked Stephen King a lot when I was in high school, but I hadn't read any of his stuff in a really long time because that was a long time ago. 
Um, this book, I, I really enjoyed it. It's a great read, um, even if you're not into writing fiction or whatever. A lot of his advice in this book, I thought, um, pertained very much to any kind of a writer. Um, you know, his uh, advice on uh, dialogue or description, you know, and, and the writing process was excellent. Um, and uh, his process for writing was fascinating. So I highly recommend that book. And so to be a good tech writer, um, you need to read technical content. And so that's advice number one from Stephen King. He emphasizes this in his book, uh, uh, that good writing requires reading. So you can write without being an avid reader. It just won't be as good. <laughs> and so if you're a tech writer and you are tasked with writing um, on a, a specific uh, topic or a specific kind of um, piece, for example, you are writing a news piece to post on your company blog. Um, it's in your best interest to go ahead and read what your company has written in the past, the, kind, the style your company uses, but then also you would want to look at what your competitors are doing. How do they do it? Because if they're doing it better than you, you might want to rethink the way you've been doing it. And then um, also some publications that you really enjoy reading, it's always good to see, or journalists that you really like, um, uh, other bloggers, um, uh, other documentation that you've seen on other projects. There are some docu uh, lots of projects that are much better documented than others, and so um, uh, I think Python has a good reputation, for example, of being excellent documentation. You'd want to see how they're doing it, and um, so that kind of research will really help you uh, in advance. Um, and so you also want to be clear on expectations anytime you're given a writing assignment, um, or if you have, like I said earlier, if you're giving yourself this assignment, um, you want to make sure you have thought about what is your purpose. It's really going to help you focus um, your topic so you're not all over the place. But if um, you've uh, been given a writing assignment from a supervisor or maybe your team wants you to uh, you know, write a report for an internal company blog or whatever, it would be very good. You need to know what the expectations are. What do they expect to see and what are the most important pieces of information they want to include. Um, it helps if you see samples of what other people have written in your company. Um, and if you are um, the first person doing this, which often happens in, in open source, you know, I've been the very first person in roles in, in organizations multiple times over the years, um, then um, Google it because other people have probably written it for other publications or other companies. And then there are how-to articles all over the place on how to write documentation or how to write an effective event report. Uh, Leslie Hawthorne, um, who is one of my colleagues now, and uh, she's well known, and I think she's probably spoken at, uh, yeah, she's spoken at this event. Um, and I, I need to give a disclaimer. There are several examples I use in here of, um, that are Red Hat examples. They weren't working for Red Hat <laughs> when I put them in this talk. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll show you another example here soon. But Leslie, I think, wasn't working for us when I put this in here. But she's back at Red Hat. Yay. And um, she wrote this excellent um, <laughs> post-event wrap-up report. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, if you need to write an event report when you get back to the office, um, she gives great advice and she let us republish it on our site. So um, like I said earlier, you're going to want to consider how your content might be reused. Every time I've given a talk over the years, I've always thought, um, this, is, this would be such a great article. When I get home, I'm going to write this article. And I never once ever went back and wrote the article after I gave the talk. So for this talk, um, I've, you know, it took me a few years, quite a few years, but I finally figured out, I was like, I'm going to write the article first. <laughs> and that worked out really well because um, you should always write the hardest thing first. Whatever's your longest, most intense piece with the most bit of information that requires the most research, write it first because then you can, you know, cut and paste stuff out. You could, um, I've even done it before where I'm writing a couple things at the same time. I'm writing the long piece and I'm like, ooh, that'll be good for this thing and I'll just copy and paste it into a little, you know, document where I'm saving and then, then that becomes a skeleton of the next thing I'm writing, which is what I did um, for this. Uh, I had thought about the talk that I was going to give and how I was going to uh, repurpose it for an article and then I was like, well, no, I better write the article first and I'll repurpose it into the talk. And so I was able to do an outline of slides um, which would help the talk because I wrote the article. And then I can tell you all at the beginning, you don't have to take a bunch of notes. It's all in this article. It works out great. All right, so here's an example of um, somebody who was not working at Red Hat. This was not a Red Hat project. I specifically hunted for a project that was not a Red Hat project to use it as, as an example, and then we acquired Ansible. So <laughs> <laughs> I had very good intentions, um, I, and, uh, I'm, and, and then the day we uh, acquired them, I, I messaged Greg and Robin 
the community manager's um, uh, VP of community and community engineer, I think is her title, messaged both of them um, and sent them a clip from The Godfather, you know, they keep pulling me back or whatever. And, um, but I'd already found these great examples and had told them, given them a heads up, I was going to uh, use these. So Greg, um, uh, he, he and Robin both had worked on Fedora project years ago, and then they both left uh, uh, at different times and were working at Ansible. And now they're at Red Hat. And he, um, uh, Ansible's a popular open source automation tool, and he needed to let the developers know about a new process. So he wrote an announcement, um, and he wrote it for the developer mailing list. And in his message, uh, it was, uh, you can find it on their mailing list, um, and I think I, link, I linked to it in the article. It was, uh, I think the subject was new process for acceptance of new modules and extras. So he's writing to let developers know about this new project. So he didn't need to define um, a bunch of terminology because this was a developer's mailing list. And so they already knew what extras were. Um, otherwise, you know, he definitely would have had to explain that. Um, so anyone on the Ansible developer mailing list, he knows the audience. They're developers. They're Ansible developers. And so if there's stuff that they don't know that he's talking about that a uh, general developer should know, that's, he can't assume that they're not going to know that stuff. They're, they're going to have to go look it up. So then Robin is writing for about the same thing, different audience. She's writing a community post for the broader community. So she um, can't assume that these are developers or that they're even experienced Ansible users. These could be people who are just trying to find out about Ansible and reading the blog. And um, so she wrote about the same process change, uh, Ansible extras, modules, plus you, how you can help. And um, so she needed to find the audience right at the beginning because anyone could be reading this and um, they needed to know, are, is this going to apply to them? And so I thought it was very smart. She uh, outlined at the very beginning um, that this uh, is an article for you if you're a user of or a contributor to Ansible Extra, mo Extras modules. Um, and there's a pull request um, for an Extras module that you've been waiting to see merged or you've been looking for a way to contribute to the community, and, or you're looking for fun and constructive ways to procrastinate doing other things you should be doing. So she um, clearly defined the audience. This brings us to the next lesson from Stephen King, invite the reader in. So she invited them in. The opening line should invite the reader in to begin the story. It should say, listen, come in here. You want to know about this. Um, this is the number one thing I see with our articles. Um, I should not have to read past the per first paragraph probably not the first sentence or two to figure out what you're talking about. And um, this is the number one thing I can do to fix an article for an author is tell people what they're writing about. I had an author last year, in fact, where I said, I hope you like what I did. I took your conclusion and announced your introduction. <laughs> because I reached the end of this you know, really long article and I was like, I don't understand what his point is. And then when I read, and the point of the article is, I was like, no, that should have been at the top. <laughs> in this article, you'll find out about this, this, and this, you know, and then you'll, it makes more sense. Plus, as the writer, it keeps you on track. Um, I, I'm giving a, a talk later today where I had to keep going and looking at what I said I was going to talk about. Otherwise, there's a million things you can talk about in an article or a talk, and so it really helps if you've had your little um, introduction. In this article, I'm going to tell you how to do this, this, and this. So readers, if it's not a good fit for them, they don't have to waste a whole bunch of time realizing this is not the right thing for them. And instead, they'll think it was a bad article as opposed to it wasn't the right article for them. Um, anything that's not essential to the story, you can let, leave out. Uh, you're telling a story. You're telling a story if you write an event report, if you send an email, unless you're just sending it, okay, I'll be there. But if you're um, you know, writing a, a general email, documentation, blog post, update on a, a developer list, you're telling a story. It might be, you're telling a story on Twitter. It might be a really short story. Um, you know, but uh, there's plenty of stuff you could be leaving out. Um, and so if you're, um, for example, if you are uh, writing an article on how to get started with GIMP, um, you probably don't need to start with, first let me tell you how to install GIMP. Um, you can kick them over to the installation instructions, leave that out. That's, um, unless your article is how to install GIMP, you don't need to include that part. Um, so you also want to leave out the boring parts. Um, and uh, I often get asked from uh, writers, how long should the article be? 
And when I was in print publishing, that was a very valid question <laughs> because you only got a certain amount of space. Online, it can be to infinity and beyond. Um, however, I can tell you how long people will pay attention and it's not to infinity. And um, so my answer is it should be as long as it needs to be. Um, if you're going over about a thousand words for an in-depth feature article, you should consider maybe this is a two-part series. Uh, maybe you should break this up into specific topics. If you're writing just a little news announcement, you're looking at five to 750 words max. Um, you know, uh, 750 words when I worked at, um, I think Sysadmin and Linux Pro Magazine, um, including figures with captions is about one print page. And so if you're thinking about reading a magazine, um, very few people these days are really into reading three, four, or five page magazines, uh, magazine articles, um, but they are more inclined to read maybe a series online. And, or if they're the kind of person who wants to read something longer and in depth, they'll go ahead and click on part two, part three, and whatever. Um, so uh, leave out the boring parts and um, uh, consider breaking into headlines, uh, subheads, and uh, sections. For example, uh, Greg's post to the Ansible developer mailing list admits details about the develop, uh, developing modules because that wasn't the point of his update. Instead, he provides a link to module guidelines um, because he, um, he, uh, that would have been a, a boring part. You don't have, all he, they needed to know was there was a change in the process. It wasn't a how to do the whole thing. In uh, Robin's case, um, you know, she is posting to uh, a broader audience, and so they actually needed more background information. Um, they uh, uh, needed to even know who she and Greg were, you know, because they don't work closely necessarily with them, as opposed to somebody on the developers list is probably going to be familiar with um, some of the uh, main people on a project. So she provides uh, a little background to the problem and explains the solution. And um, so she says, folks who keep an eye on the various Ansible repositories have probably noticed that your friendly neighborhood Ansible community team, that's me and Greg, in case I didn't know, she provides all that. And sorry, I, the rule is you're not supposed to have text heavy um, slides in a talk, but if you're talking about writing, it's kind of hard not to have text. <laughs> um, and so the boring parts for Robin is actually stuff that Greg covered. And so she links to more details for the more technical audience in Greg's announcement, um, which, uh, you know, also has uh, links to the documentation and um, links to module guidelines and um, how to contribute. And she doesn't have to go into details for that. And then she um, summarizes the solution um, uh, at the very beginning of hers to, as part of her introduction. Um, uh, she kind of gives a little summary of the, because it was a pretty long article, you know, because she was writing for a, a broader audience. but. Uh, somebody like a your re regular reader like me, I only really needed to read the first three paragraphs and so I knew everything I needed to know and then at that point after this, um, if you're really into finding out more about this, you would keep reading. I just wanted to know what's the news, what are they announcing, you know. Um, so here's, I, I provide some sample outlines and I often do this with writers for opensource.com um, because we're uh, dealing with members of the community and, and uh, most of them are not um, very experienced writers. We like working with people who are inexperienced uh, writers and helping them get their starts. And so often I will send them an outline to save them time with revisions and to get them closer to delivering um, something we can publish at the very beginning. And so um, for a news um, or community announcement, you're gonna want the introduction, you know, a brief introduction, invite them in, uh, brief background, state what the problem was. Um, and then share the news, you know, uh, and so we have this new fix and that could involve several links or whatever, you don't have to deep dive and then conclude, you know, this will be rolled out on whatever and then our next update will be whenever to learn more. We have this webinar on this time and date um, or any action items, you know, um, uh, if you want to contribute input before our final draft is up, submit by Friday, whatever. So you want to conclude with some action items and deadlines. Um, and depending on uh, what you're writing, um, you may want to include additional resources after a conclusion, such as um, a whole resource uh, section, you know, documentation links, press contacts, community resources, links to social media accounts, IRC channels, and that sort of thing. So this is um, for a more technical article, a tutorial, or a white paper. Um, uh, I, I, I'm very, I'm still surprised at how often I will get 
uh, news announcements that leave uh, no details, like I don't know what operating system this works on, you know, or um, what are the requirements for my system, um, or how do I find out more, you know, um, how do I contribute to community, uh, these are the kinds of details that um, you want to make sure are easy to find in your document. Um, so introduction, uh, provide the background, share the news, and then um, for a longer article, you know, one to two pages for print, or, you know, your 750 to 1200 words for a more in-depth feature article, that's when you would go ahead and, uh, and walk through steps for how to article. And um, uh, the other thing I see a lot of people don't do is they don't put subheads in. And subheads um, really help organize the article for readers and um, organize for yourself. Um, it, uh, it's, uh, it helps walk people through. It's, a, a, you know, it's like providing guidance through an article or um, a how-to or a tutorial. So include subheads and uh, we do um, even a couple layers of subheads and then bullets, you know, are always good too for lists. Um, and then again, you want a strong conclusion. So the care and um, feeding of the press, um, in, uh, the, uh, from the Internet Press Guild that I referred to earlier, they have a really wonderful list in, in that document of facts to include, and not just for press releases, I think these facts are things that you'd want to include in most um, articles and documentation that you're doing, um, uh, and announcements, what the product is, uh, project is, or product, uh, when was it first released, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, it was launched in blah, 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 and now we're on version whatever, um, what platforms it runs on, what uh, the configuration requirements are, um, how much it costs, if there's a cost, if, is there a free version, a community version, and then if you want these extra features, you'll have to get this other level. Um, don't make people hunt for that. It's really frustrating to try to figure out what's the free version, because I'm not gonna spend money on it if I don't like it, and I wanna make sure I like it, and I wanna test drive it first. Um, and then contact people, not, not just for the press, I mean, you want to contact people for contributing to the community. If I have questions, um, many projects now are very good about having um, uh, pages for new contributors. You'd want to make sure you provide that for new contributors, and, or if you're an advanced developer, you know, make sure you're sending readers to the right places. Um, and then uh, URLs and other contact information from our general public. Um, so editing, yay, oh my god, it's the best. Um, <laughs> after you finish your draft, you want to take a break and revisit. I, I think most people are really bad at editing their own stuff. And um, uh, particularly if you've been working on it for a while, it's really good to step away from it. And uh, I, uh, I, like most writers, I write everything at the last minute anyway, but I still try to write it where it's the night before it's due if possible, so I can visit it again in the morning before I have to hit publish um, with some fresh eyes because you're more inclined to see mistakes. Um, and then also, you want, um, if you have time, and uh, not all projects, you know, have, uh, uh, can work at a pace where people can actually review stuff, but for documentation, often you would have somebody who can review things. It's nice to have somebody who, um, uh, does, that um, is frank and direct. <laughs> Don't have your mom review it, because they love you, and um, they want you to be happy. Have somebody who's um, the critic on your team review it. Um, I have somebody on, on my team, I really like it when he reviews my stuff because I've been, um, he's, a, he's a PhD and I've been really brutal editing him and so I know he'll be brutal editing me. And um, he's told me before, you know, uh, only half of this is good and the other half is a different article and he was right and to me it was this really beautiful, brilliant piece. It was only half okay and I just deleted the other half. And, um, but I, the other people on my team are a lot nicer and they would have just said, oh, it looks good because, <laughs> you know, so have somebody who's okay with giving you honest feedback if this is an important thing to publish and will tell you if you got off topic or if you're wrong. Um, and then don't take criticism personally, and that's very hard to do as a writer, but um, you won't be, you will never get better and, and uh, you, um, if, if you just can't get people to be brutally honest and not get your feelings hurt. The other thing is, is you don't have to accept and agree with everybody's feedback. Um, I uh, do very heavy revisions on authors. I send it back, and if they don't like it, they can tell me. And um, I've had, you know, one before where I've said, well, multiple ones where I've said, okay, a piece of me died that you may have put that back in, but I'll publish it like that because it's your article, your name's on it, and ultimately your name's on it. And so you don't have to agree with everybody, and you ha don't have to accept all their changes. But it's very good to get that feedback. Okay, so you've decided what you, um, what you want to write. Uh, you know who you're writing for, you've done your research, you sketch out the outline, the outline's going to keep you honest. 
um, and you know how to edit, so what's next? Start writing. <laughs> the scariest moment is always just before you start. After that, things can only get better. Uh, and that's so true. I, um, uh, I'm giving a talk later today, and it's a 20-minute talk, and um, I have spent, I don't even know how many hours stressing out about it, and the second I sit down and start writing it, and I'm like, oh, this was not so bad. Why did I have, I literally had a nightmare about it last night, and um, writing, once you start writing, it does get better. Um, so uh, here's some contact information for me, and then I have some information about writing for us up here and some buttons and stickers, and then um, I have a little bit of time left that I can answer questions. If you have questions about specific things um, you're writing or, um, uh, you know, for your projects, uh, I'm happy to give my two cents worth, or maybe someone else in here will have had similar situations. And we have a microphone. Questions? Hello. 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 Ah, brilliant. Yes, questions. Excellent. Um, well, years ago, one of my mentors and former employers um, uh, gave excellent advice, publisher of uh, Linux New Media magazines, um, and they are still in print, so he knows what he's talking about. In fact, they just um, acquired uh, Drupal Watchdog um, in 2016 and another Linux publication, this will be my mind. Anyway, his advice was deliver content in the way people want to consume it. And that's why we have, um, you know, Twitter and um, blog posts and we have print magazines and we have PDF downloads and all of that. You can't change how people want to consume content. You can just make sure that you're delivering it in a way that everyone can consume it, you know. So that's where um, a strong introduction um, is very important and having a summary at the beginning and then they do scan, I scan, um, and I'm a speed reader online and so that's where having the, um, an outline and bulleted lists or subheads is very helpful to walk people through. So just uh, provide more structure in your articles, that's what you're saying? Um, yes, yeah, yeah, because, okay. um, uh, and just the facts, I'm, that's why I'm a heavy editor, I edit out a whole bunch of, I mean, I can, I can say in five words what someone else said in 15, you know, um, you just, don't, don't say very or some, those are words that you could delete out, there's a bunch of words like that, so yes, get to the point. Um, it's really quite simple. I was just going to say, what's like your biggest pet peeve that you come across when you're editing articles or um, reviewing a, anyone else's work? Is there anything that particularly gets under your skin? I have lots of them now because I've been doing this for so long, but they're minor peeves. You know, like um, I, I like a strong introduction. I, you know, I want to know what you're talking about within the first sentence or two. Um, uh, there um, are just so many words that don't mean anything and. Um, or aren't helpful. If you say very, for example, like I just said, or some, people use some a lot. Um, like I, I put in some code. You could just say I put in code. Um, it was some code that's implied, you know? So words like that, um, there are plenty of lists online of the words that you don't need. So those are ones off the top. And then um, um, I think I listed a lot of my P's in the talk, you know, leaving out information that is essential. Like if I read this whole thing and in the final paragraph you tell me that it only runs on Windows, I've just wasted a whole minute of my life, <laughs> you know? So um, that, that kind of information is better at the beginning of the article. Cool, thanks. Um, that's a great question because I, my career started working on Sysadmin magazine, which was, um, it was, the subhead was a journal for Unix Sysadmins or systems administrators. And then later we started covering Linux also. So this was a long time ago and it was much more formal and it was, um, uh, uh, 
that it has changed a lot in the last two decades on and that kind of stuff, you know, voice and whatever. But I'm still pretty old school about that. Um, I think that most things that you work on, unless it, it's your thing that you launched your project, you want someone else to be able to pick up and keep going unless you plan on being on it forever and taking it down with you, <laughs> you know? Um, with that said though, for pers more personal stories, like people write for us their open source story, their Linux story, you want a bit of a writer's voice in there. We w work with a lot of non-native English speakers and so we do um, polish their English and, and they like that. They want to you know, get the point across. Um, and so um, I, I think some voice is okay in it, but I get rid of um, uh, a lot of slang because you're also dealing with international readers in the international communities, and so um, you need to be mindful of slang and colloquial, uh, you know, terminology that people might not get. So you have to be careful with it, I guess. Um. Do we, hello, there we go. <laughs> Do we have uh, any more questions? No? I had a question. I just, if a clown offers me a manuscript but says I have to come down to the sewer to get it, should I follow him? <laughs> Again, there are trends, <laughs> All right. so it depends on how interest you are. Um, anyway, please join me in thanking Ricky, that was fantastic. Thank, Thank you very much.